Hello and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, both as a group and as solo artists, past, present, and things to come. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and a bunch of other things, and a music critic for The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and whoever can afford me, basically. Um, <laughs> dwindling set of people. And I'm joined by my three regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hi, Alan. Hi, everybody. And Steve Marinucci, the world's last remaining full-time Beatles reporter. Not that there were that many. You can read his work in Billboard.com and Access.com. That's A-X-S dot com. And he is the author of a book, Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones. Hello, Steve. Hello, Alan. Hello, everyone. And Al Sussman, the executive editor of Beatle Fan Magazine and the author of the book Changing Times, 101 Days That Shaped a Generation. Hello, Al. Hi, Alan. Hello there, everybody. And this week we have a special guest who's been with us before, and that is Chip Mattinger, who is the author of the massive Leninology project, the first volume of which, Strange Days Indeed, is already out, and there is more to come. And uh, the reason Chip is joining us is because we're going to be talking about John Lennon's Imagine album. No particular occasion, other than that this year is the 45th anniversary of its release, but we theoretically don't celebrate anniversaries, so I didn't really <laughs> say that. <laughs> But you can keep it in the back of your mind. So, um, Chip, how are you doing? Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me back on. Hi, Chip. Hi, Chip. Hey, Chip. So, um, imagine, uh, where does that, I mean, you've, you've spent a lot of time in the last God knows how many years. I mean, it seems to be at least 10, right? I mean, maybe more than that. Yeah, it's more uh, than that. We're pushing think, 15 now. Yeah. Um, so you've been sort of steeped in all of Lennon's work and Yoko's work and the details of the sessions, the details of their lives. Where, where does Imagine stand for you in the complete canon? Imagine the, the album was kind of the turning point from when they were in the U.K., to when they began their life in New York. Mm -hmm. um, it was released uh, basically w within a month of, of the time that they immigrated to the, to the States. And uh, most of it was, it, it was done kind of 50, 50 in the UK and in the U S mm -hmm. so it, it's kind of right on the, right on the bubble there of, of when they were uh, leaving Britain and, and entering the States. Right. And so in, in addition to, the, the session material and, and a good amount of that has leaked out over the years and is available on various um, underground uh, sources. Uh, there's also the film. The, the, the sessions were filmed and uh, they've made at least two official releases of stuff based on films from those sessions. Uh, do they film that much in the U.S.? They didn't film any of the U.S. sessions, but they filmed a lot of uh, silent material mm -hmm. uh, in and about New York City. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So that all got cut in with some of the session stuff for the Imagine film. And uh, actually, there are probably three. You could you could clarify this um, more quickly than I can. There are probably three video cute. projects. <laughs> One was the video album, you know, that came out, at, that was shown as a film at the time, and then there was Gimme Some Truth. Right. And wasn't there a third, or am I thinking of the other, um, you know, the, the larger Imagine John oh, Lennon movie that had a bunch of the material in it? That could be it. Yeah. Because that's mm. where a lot of that new material premiered, and, and there was a lot of bonus material on the, the uh, DVD 10 years ago when that came out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when I was saying, um, where does it stand for you? I meant, you know, in terms of, you know, your feeling about it as an album within the whole canon. It's in the top three. It's it's not my favorite, and it's it's definitely up there at the top. The songwriting was was it was like he said. It was 
the plastic ono band with sugar on top yeah. or mm. so it, it was uh, a lot more listener friendly uh, it wasn't so draining once once you finish the album yeah um, well you know he said that and you can see why he said it if you think of you know the the title song and things like that but it also does have give me some truth and it has how do you sleep and it has i don't want to be a soldier mama and mm. uh you know even it's so hard i mean a lot of it doesn't really have sugar on top right right you know there are is a harder edge to that album than you know it's on par with the plastic ono band album but i think that's got a harder edge on it than than anything that followed right Mm -hmm. Um, It was recorded very quickly, just like the Plastic Ono Band. Mm -hmm. Um, Just a handful of tracking sessions and and a couple of overdubbing dates. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mm -hmm. as his career progressed, he'd spend more and more time in the studio, you know, polishing things up and and adding more production. So uh, it it does definitely does have an edge to it. It's you know one of my favorite tracks is "How Do You Sleep" and and George Harrison's contributions to the album are, are just amazing. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Is there anything particular to say about the atmosphere during the sessions, and, and as, especially since it was split over the two countries? Uh, did he seem to have a, a, a coherent project in mind first, or did it just sort of? come together as he had enough tracks for an album that was the album i think that's it once once there were enough tracks they they recorded just those and then produced just those and and that was it uh the the sessions the the first song to be recorded was it so hard Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. and that was done back during the power to the people sessions Mm -hmm. and it was one of the first songs recorded at, at the home studio ascot sound then they they had some some running around chasing Kyoko Yoko's daughter and uh, John did some more composing during that time and then the sessions kicked off uh, with the recording of the the God Save Us single mm-hmm. which was uh, to to raise funds for Oz Magazine's uh, court defense so then they had a, a week worth of tracking at Ascot Sound just. just they do two songs a day, except for one day. Uh, Imagine was the only track that was recorded, mm-hmm. and Oh My Love was was a single day as well. And then the uh, the tape sat for a while, for about a month. And by that time, they they made a trip over to New York City, where they would um, do some overdubs, primarily the string overdubs, which were all done in one day. And uh, Klaus uh, tightened up some bass pieces and. I think John might have done a little bit of vocal work, but then the album was mixed incredibly fast. It was mixed on July 5th, mm-hmm. and the quad album was mixed on July 7th, and that was it. So, okay. It's, it's, okay, so before I pass you over to Ken, just one other question. The, the next volume in Lanternology is going to have the session info, correct? That's correct. Okay, that's and correct. When, when can we expect that? No, oh, I'm, I'm hoping sometime in... 2017 okay. um it, it's uh it's the format's still a little up in the air on, on how i'm going to produce it but it, it is definitely going to contain the session info okay so over to ken mm. hello ken so uh <laughs> hi chip good to have you back Thank um you. i i just wanted to ask bouncing off what you just discussed there with alan we should assume that as far as the recording sessions in new york are concerned those were mainly overdubs were there That's any correct. basic tracks at all that were done in New York? Um, only for Yoko's Fly album. Mm. None of which was which were happening around the same time. But no, all of, all of the basic tracks for Imagine were done at Ascot Sound. Can you tell us um, who worked on the string arrangements for certain songs on Imagine? Because I mean, how do you sleep? The string arrangement is so powerful. It's just so eerie the way that whole thing was was arranged. And also how and, and the title track to imagine some wonderful work was done with the strings. Who worked on that? All, all of the string arrangements were done by Tori Zito. Mm. You know anything about him? He was if you want. Frankie okay. son of a gun, and he's since left us. But uh, I called Tori to, to interview him for the book, and his response was, I don't remember anything about it, and I don't want to talk about it. 
Hmm. So it was just another date for him, I think. But all of the uh, string overdubs were done in a single day on the 4th of July, 1971. It was a Sunday, and uh, uh, Alan, I think, tried to help me. We went through an an old uh, AFM directory and tried to track down some of the string players, and and we couldn't find a single one of them. (laughs) So the flux fiddlers will remain unknown. (laughs) You'd think they want to come forward after all these years and just mm-hmm. give themselves some credit for being on a John Lennon album. Yeah, you right. think? Because a lot of them were on the Ram album as well. The same players? The same players. John looked up the same players that Paul had used for uh, the string overdubs on Ram. Huh. Okay. Actually, all he would have had to do is hire the same contractor and said, get those same guys, and the contractor could have found them all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... And, and in fact, that may be what he did. I don't know. That's the easy way to do it anyway. There were only a few months between the sessions. I mean, I think we were in February for the January for the RAM work and, uh, you know, July for the, the Imagine work. Mm-hmm. Wow. Can you tell us something more about the relationship between John and Phil Spector? I mean, we have seen the footage that's in Give Me Some Truth of the two of them arguing during the sessions for Oyoko and there's all the, the material that's on the uh, that was on the Lost Lennon tapes, which was also included in the Lennon anthology set. Did they was there a real mutual respect for the two of them? Because when you hear the two of them arguing, you might just see one side of it all. There was definitely a mutual respect there. I think I think John was somewhat in awe of Phil and, and, and the work that he'd done. And he'd often refer to one of his previous productions when he'd say how he wanted something to sound. For example, the the, the string arrangements for and the, and the, the production for the Happy Christmas single. John said to Phil, he said, give me the backing that you gave to George in reference to the... Uh, Try Some, Buy Some song on the uh, Living in the Material World album. Right. Which uh, we're kind of out of sequence here, but that backing was recorded earlier in 1971 for a an album project with Phil's wife, Ronnie. But uh, the album was, was actually a co-production between Phil and John and Yoko, and uh, they definitely reined Phil in, and the, the album stripped down, but not as much so as the Plastic Ono Band album. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Okay. okay. So do you know of any specific examples of Phil's contribution of what he added as far as, you know, the layering? Was he just very, you know, involved? I, I would think certainly How Do You Sleep, you know, a song like that. I think he was he was involved in the arrangement somewhat. Um, there are the little clips of film where, where John says, well, what do we do on this one, artistic representative? And Phil says, uh, just... You and you and Klaus and Alan, and it, you know that the whole thing's starting to sound the same. But uh, so I, th- I think Phil was involved mostly in the arrangements. Did he have a lot to do with um, the idea of having the string arrangement too? That I couldn't answer. I know he he, he was hard on John when it came to the vocals and, and uh, making sure that he had a had a great vocal to work with. Mm-hmm. Anything in particular that you can shed some light on with that relationship? Because it was kind of a rocky road, you know, going from Imagine to sometime in New York City where Phil was only there for a short time. Then he came back for rock and roll, and uh, we all know what happened there. But I guess during Imagine, I guess um, the relationship was, was, um, they were getting along fine. It was probably at at its peak because Phil was present for all of the sessions in this case. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Whereas the Plastic Ono band, he was, he was there for a handful. And as you said, you know, he's only there for part of some time in New York City and, and the rock and roll sessions. Yeah, it's kind of interesting in a way, because when you think of Phil Spector, you think of multi-layers and this big, you know, the wall of sound kind of thing. And it's not really that way on Imagine. There's, there's a few songs that are far more produced. Like I said, How Do You Sleep? Maybe a little bit on Jealous Guy. Um mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, for the most part, it's still he still held back from that sound, you know, especially what he gave to George Harrison, too, on All Things Must Pass. Uh, I was going to say one neat contribution that Phil had to the project was they would do, like I mentioned, they did the tracking at Ascot Sound, but they also did stereo 
mixes of all of the songs. And they, they were finished. They were the backings, and those were layered onto a, the multi-track tape in New York, and basically the strings played to the finished backings. So when it came time to remix the album, all of the stereo tracks from London were already locked in, and the strings were really the only thing that could be mixed in stereo, which is one reason that album sounds so dense, and that there's so little movement amongst the stereo mix and amongst the quad mix is because there really wasn't anything for them to work with except for the strings because it was all locked in. Okay. Um, who wants to be next? How about you, Steve? Okay. All right. Um, and, and let's break here for a second. The uh, John wasn't fighting with Phil. He was fighting with Phil McDonald. The Indian. Yeah, that's what I always thought. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But Phil and John are in the, in the booth together, and they're both picking on Phil McDonald. Right. Okay. What was that all about, Chip? What they had was um, John changed the lyrics to one of the verses of O Yoko, and he had the vocals on on two different tracks. And one track was the overdub. One track was the the basic vocal. And Phil was having difficulty locating the point on the tape <laughs> to cue in the backing vocals. So John was just well, very I, impatient in the studio. He he was uh, very anxious to to move on as quickly as possible, and uh, he he just lost his patience with him. <laughs> okay. Okay. You know, talking about imagine everybody talks about the song, and looks at the words as as um, kind of like an anthem. And I've never really, for whatever reason, I'd never have taken that song as seriously as an anthem as maybe other people have. I mean, because Lennon had, you know, habits of writing words that didn't mean much of anything. How, uh, I mean, what, what would you say to that? John had said that uh, Imagine was a sincere statement and that he was trying to think of peace in terms of children so that children could understand it. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Interesting. That's uh, I mean it it, it did it has it, you know it's it's very simple and and it has got picked up uh, all over the place. Um, that's, that's I mean can you, is there anything else you could say about that? About the Imagine song in particular, uh, he he often referred to it as as I mentioned, probably in, in greater terms of the album, but he's referred to the song specifically as working class hero with sugar on it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Can we also talk about uh, how do you sleep, and was the what, did that did the lyrics to that really uh, were as bitter as uh, was the relationship really as bitter as the lyrics suggested? I don't think so. John had often gone to say that that's just how he was feeling at that time. He didn't always feel that way about Paul, but at the moment when he wrote the lyrics and recorded the song, that's how he was feeling about their relationship at the time. The, uh, the song goes back much further. Uh, it goes back into at least early 1970, but at that time, John didn't have any of the lyrics for it, except so Sergeant Pepper took you by surprise. And on a, a series of demo recordings for it, he uh, used the words for rock and roll music as a placeholder. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, John, uh, John said that, you know, basically, I mean, it was, this was almost sort of like a school ground fight, and it's sort of like when, the, when they sort of took the two of them apart, John said, basically, he started it. They, that's right. Um, John and Yoko both felt that uh, Paul and Linda, who had produced the Ram album together, had felt that there were some, uh, some hidden digs on the album towards the Lennons. Specifically in the song "Too Many People," but too many people preaching practices, mm -hmm. okay. and uh, the end of the back seat of my car. We, we believe that we can't be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, John and Yoko <laughs> took those as, as as direct messages, direct digs towards them, and I think that probably had a lot to do with uh, how the lyrics to "How Do You Sleep" eventually turned out. Um, Alan Klein was was. Uh, Involved somewhat in the, the composition of the lyrics, and uh, there's the uh, story about how Alan contributed the line, it's just another day. <laughs> and uh, John's reaction to that was, and you probably binged 
pinch that bugger anyway, which yeah. uh, they decided to, to leave out. Uh, <laughs> the possibility of libel. So, hmm. okay. it's actually what what was used was a very clever line. The only thing you done was yesterday, and since you've gone, you're just another day. So that was a combination of the two of them coming uh, up with that together. I think so. I think so. But no, you're right. It isn't. It's a brilliant exposition to, to to you know the the best song is the Beatles, and then the last song that Paul had had out is a, a single. He's saying that well, that's what what you that's all you're doing nowadays. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. Also, yeah. it's, it's too ahead. many people that there is that line. You took your lucky break and broke it in two, right? Which you can, yeah, interpret as being directed to John yeah. and Yoko. Yeah, sure. Or John and Paul, and then, you know. So Al has been sitting there patiently waiting to yeah. you know, for his turn. <laughs> no problem. Uh, actually, bouncing off something that Steve was just saying about you know his feeling that, that Imagine is not really as much of an anthem as it's kind of been proclaimed to be. Uh, there actually, though, is another song on there that, has become kind of an anthem. In fact, I'm su- I'm surprised we haven't heard it more in recent weeks. And that's "Give Me Some Truth." Mm-hmm. Any thoughts on that? That's that's another track that dates back to uh, the Get Back era, the early 1969. And uh, although it was is credited just to John, I think Paul probably did have some some what of a hand in, in uh, composing that. Um, mm. I think if you go back and listen to the Get Back tapes, there's a little back and forth between the two of them about the lyrics to the song. Right. But, uh, yeah, I, I am surprised that, you know, neither one of the candidates have, have picked that up and, and and used it to their advantage. Well, well, actually, it's not surprising that either of the two candidates have used Give Me Some Truth. Uh, <laughs> but I'm surprised we haven't been able to uh, haven't been hearing it from, you know, other sources if you get oh, sure. drift. the pundits and- <laughs> yeah yeah exactly mm-hmm. yeah um let me see if if i maybe i'm uh, misremembering something but you mentioned that uh it's so hard was the first track recorded for uh for the imagine album if i'm remembering correctly uh didn't i think it was the lost lennon tapes included at some point the the basic the basic track for it's so hard without the overdubs. I That's think correct. So. Right. That's correct. It it was tracked in February, and it was one of the other tracks that they they added the overdubs in New York City with uh, the sax player King Curtis. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. And uh, King Curtis worked on 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 two tracks: Soldier. I don't want to be a soldier. Right. And uh, and it's so hard. And uh, basically, they, they went into the studio, and, and John played them a couple lines on the guitar, and this is kind of how I'd like it. And Curtis went out and did his thing in the studio, and, and uh, Curtis said, well, John, how do you want me to play it? And he says, I want you to play it like a sax player would play it. <laughs> so uh, one of the neat things on, on Soldier is that there were three open tracks on the, on the multi track, and Curtis went through and did a solo on each one of the empty tracks and then they made a composite for the solo at the uh, when it was mixed which is one reason why we have the differences in the mix between the quad and the stereo mm-hmm. and uh, why the uh, the sax solo wasn't uh, reconstructed exactly as it was uh, on the 1999 remix of the album so uh, you know, that's just kind of how the, these mixed variations come about. Uh, maybe you should explain why there was a quad mix. Quadraphonic sound, I, I think, was <laughs> definitely in its, in its infancy at the time. Yes. And uh, Capital was uh, was looking for a way to get into the, the quad market, and what better way than to, to use the album by one of your biggest artists. Uh, so they... they did the quad mix, as I mentioned, they did it in one day, and all of the songs but four uh, were uh, given quad mixes. Four of the songs, which I'd have to go back and, 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 and pull them out, were just basically the stereo tracks reproduced in the front and the back. 
and the others had the string and the sax overdubs, and those were the only things that were, were moved about in the, in the mix. And uh, the day after they did the Imagine mixes, they prepared a quad mix of the Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Really? Uh-huh. Yeah. Which has never seen the light of day. Right. right. They sure. made a quad mix of the, uh, the 65 show. Right. Right. Mm. Yeah, because quad ended up lasting about, oh, I don't know, about 20 minutes. And yet it's here again as 5.1, and they could actually probably bring all those mixes out again, and and, and, and they might have a life this time. You yeah. Know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Also, unlike Plastic Ono Band, where there was a very small kind of self-contained band on that album, which was basically John, Klaus, Eric Clapton, uh, Ringo, a little bit of Billy Preston, Imagine was really more of, almost if you want to call it that, almost more of an all-star collection of, of sidemen. Maybe you can take us through some of those some of those people. There was a bit of an open door, a uh, revolving mm-hmm. door, um, a set of musicians on the Imagine album. There were the, the basic backing uh, musicians of, of, of Alan White on drums. Uh, Jim Keltner did a couple of the tracks. Klaus mm-hmm. Foreman on bass. And Nicky Hopkins on keyboard. And John on either keyboard or guitar. Other musicians that, that came in and worked were... Uh, John Taup from Renaissance uh, played mm-hmm. keyboards on How Do You Sleep. Uh, some of the uh, the two guys from Badfinger, Tommy and Joey, Tommy, right? and, yeah, mm-hmm. went in and added acoustic guitar on two songs. Um, a few of the other uh, Apple people, uh, Steve Brendel, who was a, a an Apple film archivist at, at the time, uh, was part of the uh, the bass duo on uh, Crippled Inside with the string bass with uh, Klaus uh, fretting the notes, and Steve was playing drums on the strings. <laughs> so there were uh, several musicians that came in and out. and uh, Plus, of course, George Harrison. Oh, yeah, him. <laughs> <laughs> and we already mentioned King Curtis, too. So. Right. right. Also, there was someone named Andy Davis, who was yep. in a band called Stackridge right. uh, oh, yes. back in the 70s. And later join a band called the Corgis, which yeah. um, right. had a had a big hit with a song that's very Lennon esque, called um, "Everybody's Gotta Learn Sometime." Mm-hmm. And a couple of the guys from uh, Wishbone Ash were in, played oh, guitar. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so so they had the core group of musicians, and then they they filled up the studio with with people. It's a, it's amazing that uh, "How Do You Sleep" was the, was the first song to be filmed. For the imagined film, and uh, they had a, a full studio that day in between the camera crews and the, and the sound recordists and all of the additional musicians. That Phil suggest Phil Spector suggested that they add a second drummer on the track, and and John was like, "Yeah, but where would we put him?" <laughs> Chip, uh, I was going to about the imagined video. Uh, Chip, who um, who's who, who did the concept for that? The music video itself, not for the whole film. I'm just that, that since that's such an iconic. Uh, Guys, I I don't know don't anything know. about it that besides that it was just a, a little bit of conceptual bit of film that uh, mm-hmm. that they uh, worked into the uh, the the overall imagined film. It was filmed in the the white room, the the gallery where they had several of uh, Yoko's. Uh, Art pieces mm-hmm. up and exhibited, but they were out of the camera shot for that uh, for that particular video. But uh, I think it was just another. It was kind of a performance video, and, and Yoko decided, well, you know, I'll get up and open the windows and and yeah. let some light in. And there were uh, there were several takes. Oh, there were takes okay. of, of that particular song. So mm-hmm. uh, I have a feeling that it, uh, you know progressed and, and became a, a, a little more uh, professional or, or uh, and conceptual at the same time and that uh, well I was gonna say I was gonna say I mean it, it would seem to me that that was pretty much Yoko's concept mm-hmm. would you agree yes I would yeah. uh, I think 
started as a performance piece with John at the piano, and and Yoko added her performance to it with the the addition of light into the room. Mm-hmm. But the, I love that you know the all white thing is definitely something is definitely a Yoko concept there, and mm. and uh, and uh, the fact that that video has lived on the way it has. Is, I mean, it's. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautifully done video that would have survived anyway. But you have to give her a lot of the. the I would think you would have to give her a lot of the credit for that, uh, for the the conceptualizing in that. And it's just. I mean, because that's. It just fits into her whole scheme of being the way she is. You know, the mm-hmm. way what she's done. You know, the that type of thing. But. Chip, can you tell us something about what the research was for, you know, they've, they've put out documentaries about Imagine, and, and yet they, in, in some ways, haven't told us a lot of information, and certainly the kind of information I know you look for in these projects of yours. Um, can you give us any sense of, you know, how you track down some of the, the session information and that kind of thing? A lot of it had to do with uh, tracking down the musicians who played on the album and the engineers that were involved in the album. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of them actually kept diaries of, of where they were working and who they were, what songs they were working on. And it, it was just a huge puzzle that uh, you get a hold of enough people and enough pieces of information and you can start to put it back together and put it in the proper sequence. Mm-hmm. Uh, same thing, uh, just uh, um, Yoko's got a series of, of reissues coming out here now, and uh, her Yoko Ono Plastic Ono Band album was basically six reels of, of improvisations, and I've been uh, struggling to, to pull that album and all of the outtakes from it and, and putting them uh, back into their proper order, and you can just hear how it flowed from this style of music to this style of music to a little bit of silence and a little bit, a lot of bit of noise. And so it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's just a huge puzzle that if you talk to enough people, you can put it back together. And and you mentioned before we, before we started taping that the, the Yoko reissue actually has some unreleased stuff on it. There were, everybody seemed to think that uh, they were, they had just re put out the, the Ryko albums, but that's not mm. the case, is it? I did as I did as well. I thought it was just going to be the same bonus tracks, but I am uh, was pleased to find out that the uh, extended version of Why did have some additional material on it. And as collectors hear it, they will instantly recognize where the first part of the the piece came from and where the second half of the piece came from. And this this new bit of recording that's on the uh, that's on a bonus track on the on the CDs, I believe. Uh, is shows the bridge in between the two, and, and it's really kind of neat to hear. I'm anxious to see what they're going to put onto some of the later albums. But as for the the two virgins and the life with the lions, I don't think there's there's really going to be anything new that we didn't see on the Rika disc. On the two uh, virgins, uh, on the the previous commercial releases, have had some material cut out. Has it been restored now? That I don't know yet. I know that Sean was heavily involved in the remastering of the albums. And if they use the right tapes, then that little bit of uh, that was missing from the uh, Two Virgins album should be restored. But in looking at what were early running times on uh, Apple's website, on iTunes, uh, the iTunes store, it looked like it was the shorter running time. So it's, it's yet to be seen if it's all there or not. Mm-hmm. I think you're one of the few people who've actually heard the mono version of Two Virgins, which didn't get around very much. Um, is, is there any audible difference? Is it just a stereo fold down or, or is it a different mix? No, that, that was a really tough piece to track down. It, uh, the mono mix was prepared first. Mm-hmm. And uh, John Brackett's remixed uh, the album into stereo. So it was more of trying to make some ping pong effects or, or the like with out of the mono tape ah. for the stereo album. I see. I see. So it was a fold up. <laughs> yes, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> okay. 
Matter of fact, I heard recently an interview with you on a uh, <clears throat> another Beatles podcast, and um, <laughs> and you you, uh, uh, you you mentioned that you had been able to kind of do with some detective work figure out when exactly the Two Virgins album or the you know the occasion of that was actually re- uh, recorded. Yes, yes, um, I can attribute uh, a lot of that was to the, the gumption of my co-author, Scott Riley, who mm-hmm. one of the things we decided was we really need to pin down what was the night of, of Two Virgins, because as we all know, uh, Mark Lewison uh, in the pre-internet age had pinned it as, as being on um, May 19th, 1968, and we've had a lot more uh, uh, tools at our disposal and were able to uh, determine that it actually happened uh, a couple of weeks earlier and that it was the uh, the evening of uh, May 4th, ah. May 3rd into May 4th. So uh, the way that we were able to determine that was uh, Donovan was playing a concert in Rome uh, that weekend and uh, Cynthia and uh, Jenny Boyd, who was Don, Donovan's paramour, was uh, went on the, on the trip to Rome to see Donovan's performance. Uh, so, for one, we were able to find out uh, when the concert took place, but also Jenny Boyd had recently been busted for possession, and she had had her passport confiscated, and Scott turned up uh, the newspaper article where the lawyer went and asked if her passport could be restored for the weekend so that she could go to, to Italy to see Donovan. So that really kind of pinned it down on, on to when it did take place. Okay. So it happened before John and Paul's trip to New York City. Exactly. That's what I was just going to mention, that in the timeline, that uh, that's quite different from the, the kind of the version that we know. Okay. That's right. Uh, it, it, it turns a lot of things around that, you know, they – had their relationship definitely predated the Apple trip to New York, and who knows how long it was really going on before that, because, mm-hmm. as I mentioned, uh, for all intents and purposes, John and Yoko were having an affair. And that's not something that necessarily got written up or that they wanted to promote. So I think they kind of uh, they kind of came up with the backstory of the, the evening out at Kenwood, and, and that's what stuck. Uh-huh. Now, some of this stuff is in Strange Days indeed, right? You, you, the, this timeline, I think, isn't right. it? Okay, and this is uh, the, the volume that is currently available. That's right. Uh, volume one of Leninology, Strange Days indeed, is a uh, subtitle to Scrapbook of Madness, and it is a day-by-day uh, journal of written without foresight of, of John and Yoko's life together from 1968 through 1980. And... Uh, as each of these events happens, you can you see their life unfold, and uh, everything is is been researched from scratch, and uh, I think it's really a, a strong foundation. Uh, it's a piece of research work. Um, it's it's not a biography, so uh, all of the backup is there, but none of the uh, the kiss and tell type stories are included. Okay. Okay. But it is a biography of him as a working musician. I mean, as you read from entry to entry, it's like this is the stuff that if you're if you're more interested in the work he did than in the kiss and tell stuff, it's 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 really a biography in that sense. It, it feels like when you read it. By all means, it, it's it's something that uh, is definite. It's it, there are events that did happen, and they did happen on the dates that we've attributed to them. And anything that we really couldn't pin down, you know, it didn't go in the book. Mm-hmm. We should probably ask you where people can find this. Ah, uh-huh. Strange Days Indeed is available on the website, www.leninology.com. Uh, there is both a paperback edition and a limited hardback edition, which uh, has selling quite well and there are less than 100 copies of the hardback available so if you're interested now's the time to get it okay all right enough okay Good plug yeah, christmas time is coming that's yes, right it is. yes it is mm-hmm. i wanted to add a couple of things 
I know that we were talking about Give Me Some Truth before. And um, in Hunter Davies' book, The John Lennon Letters, there is something in there where John said that Paul did help him out with the lyrics. So it's in John's own words that he said that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I know we were bringing that up before. And also about the song Imagine, it's kind of ironic. We just did a show on uh, you know, the Beatles and politics, mm-hmm. and uh, we never really talked about Imagine at all. Because when you listen to the words of Imagine, that's, his, that's John's vision of a utopian world, which is, to me, very political. You know, it's a world without borders. You know, it's a world without mm-hmm. countries. We're all the same. You know, there's no division between any of us. So I, I definitely look at that as a, a as a political song. Mm-hmm. And the song has over the years come under attack by some, you know, conservative commentators. I think William Buckley did a column about how what what a horrible piece it is. Nile. Nihilistic, I think, yeah. was the one of the one of the phrases he used. Well, yeah. and yeah, it's been it's been criticized a lot. Every time, you know, anytime somebody brings up something about Lenin, or some conservative brings up something about Lenin because of the, they take it as anti-religious, which is, you know, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I also wanted to comment a bit about the video that was made for the whole album. Wasn't that kind of ahead of its time in its way? I mean, oh, you wow. had videos for for virtually every song. There was a, a video for every song on the album, and one thing that they were particularly proud of for the, uh, the the film as a whole was that there were only two words of dialogue in the whole thing, and that's when John and Yoko looked down on the, from their bedroom onto the doppelgangers on the on the patio and say good morning to each other. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and the rest of the the rest of the film strictly music. But, so, do you uh, know if that? Was that Yoko's idea? Since we were just talking about the video for the song, Imagine, probably you know mainly coming from Yoko. Do you know if this whole concept of the whole album like this did that come from Yoko? I couldn't say. Hmm. I think it was a, a everything that uh, was produced by either John and Yoko was really a joint project, even if only one of their names was on it at the time. They did everything together. They were in each other's pocket. They co-produced each other's pieces of work, and um, so I, I think it was definitely a collaboration between the two of them, as opposed to being strictly a, a Yoko concept. Mm-hmm. Can you walk us through uh, some of the differences, uh, apart from the sax solos on uh, Soldier, um, between Yoko's 1999 remix and the standard mix, which came out again on the 2010 box set? You know how long it's been since I listened to that? <laughs> <laughs> I listened to him today, actually. Uh, and, you know, there's a pre- probably a lot of things I didn't hear. I mean, the, the remix actually sounded a bit clearer to me in terms of instrumental profiles. But, but both of them are, you know, kind of a little squashed uh, for reasons that you explained earlier, you know, about the mixes. They're um, both very dense. Uh, How Do You Sleep is basically a mono recording with, with the stereo strings. When they went back to the, the multitracks, to the 8-track, not an 8-track player, but the, the 8-track multitrack, they were able to have a little more uh, room to play with, with the tonality of each of the instruments. Uh, I think it's, a, it's not as dull as it sounds on the original vinyl. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. The original mix, you know, it does have more of a high end to it, and, and it is uh, spread out a little more the the sound stage. Mm-hmm. And I think that can be said for just about every track on the album. And uh, you know, a lot of people say, "Oh, you shouldn't have been messing with it." And uh, what's Yoko doing? But I'm I'm really thankful to have you know different versions of the album to listen to. Mm-hmm. More to catalog too. <laughs> That's right. More pages, more books. <laughs> right. <laughs> so should we um should we talk about you have another project in the works? Yeah, I guess I guess we can do that. Um mm. guys, I, I uh typed this up so that I, I don't leave anything out, so I'll try and make it sound like I'm I'm not reading it off. But uh Oh ad lib. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll, I'll Go do ahead. my best here. Um well, after the release of Eight Arms to Hold You in 2000, 
I uh, began to gather data for a potential update, uh, which, as I kind of said before, was the genesis of Strange Days Indeed, that I'd, I'd never gotten past John. Now, it kind of would have been irresponsible of me not to stockpile any McCartney information that I had discovered along uh, the way during the production of Leninology. And there was definitely some very exciting information that I did turn up, um, which I kind of filed away without any particular project in mind. So I was about a year, 18 months ago, I, I was speaking with Alan Cozen, and he told me of a project that he was working on with a, a British researcher named Adrian Sinclair. And after a few more conversations, it kind of seemed natural for me to uh, join their team and to pass along the the session information and the interviews that I collected over the years, uh, especially as I kind of had my hands full working on volume two of the Leninology series. So we fast forward here to uh, November 2016 and proud to announce that the basic research has been completed and the writing phase has begun for McCartney Legacy which is going to be a multi-volume reference uh, detailing the artistic endeavors of Paul as a solo artist. And uh, the as of yet untitled volume one is going to cover from Paul's score for The Family Way through the Wings rehearsals at Root Studio for Band on the Run. And the con combination of the contemporary uh, studio documentation paired with an extensive uh, series of key interviews, we've, we've talked to some really important people that, that were there at the time, uh, is going to result in the de definitive history of, of Paul as a solo artist, uh, both on his own and with wings. And it kind of seems natural that uh, McCartney Legacy is going to be pre presented in a uh, format that's similar to the future volumes of Leninology. So they'll uh, dovetail together as much as they can. So there are a pair of uh, very exciting solo era books in the pipeline. Uh, the McCartney Legacy website and Facebook page are imminent. That would be McCartneyLegacy.com, and that will uh, bring any visitors up to date on the book's progress along with any sort of uh, pre-ordering information. Once there's some info wow. on the page. Once there's some info. <laughs> so Alan's had this under his hat all, all along. Yeah, it's been a secret. Mm -hmm. But I thought, you know, rather than have Chip mention it on, say, some competing podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had a big Chicago interview earlier this week, and I, I nope, I got to wait. And, uh. <laughs> yeah, it's going really well. I mean, you know, a Adrian Sinclair has done also a lot of research and turned up some incredible stuff, and we've all done interviews with various people. And uh, you know, so this first volume really just go in a way people might say well yeah you're you're stopping short of band on the run what sense does that make but basically it's wings mark 1 you know mm -hmm. because they they leave <laughs> before they go to record band on the run so it's a really good stopping point and that's actually a pretty exciting period for him you know mm -hmm. yeah, and it hasn't been well so, documented in the past so no. as much as eight arms tried to we we really come up with a, a, a accurate timeline for the recording of each of the songs for that period of time. Uh, do you ultimately? How many volumes do you anticipate having? Uh, that was my that that was basically my question. Oh, do you want? Uh, do you uh, do you guys? Are you anticipating going through the entirety of his career? Because obviously, with with John, there's you know a finite amount right. of of time. With Paul, you're dealing with a career that you know that is ongoing. Yeah, that is still ongoing, and is mm -hmm. you know uh, we're, we're talking now forty six years. Well, correct me, Ellen, if I'm, I'm wrong here, but I think we've kind of uh, blocked out up through the end of Wings, up through uh, pre tug of war at this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think the intention is. It, is to go on and and certainly um young adrian will live to the end of the project I don't, right. know, I don't know about me and and chip's a bit younger than i am too so <laughs> yeah i mean you know we've uh, in fact well um i talked to someone who really worked on some some of the stuff in the 80s uh, 87 86 uh you know is an interview that we've sort of put into the you know into the 
the vault for when we get up there. So, so the idea is to get up there, um, mm-hmm. and uh, we'll we'll just see how it goes. You know. Wow, um, that's amazing. That's very interesting. Yeah, that is that is very cool. Um, yeah, that's very that's very cool. Congratulations, you guys. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Yeah, it it should be fun. It should be good. It's it's it, we've got a lot of information that nobody has. You know, other people have tried to do McCartney discographies and sessionographies, and it's sure. it's hard to get that info. You know, and uh, yeah. like Chip says, you know, when I asked about doing it for the Lennon project. I mean, I, I, I was really just asking it as an actual question about the Lennon book, and his answer was, uh, oh, yeah, right, that's what we're doing, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, then so, that, begs, that begs the question, have you got eyes on doing Harrison, maybe even Ringo? No. <laughs> no, no, that's where we'll uh, you know, draw the line at uh, John and Paul. Okay. He says that now. Uh, yes. No, that's it's not going to happen. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Yep. Now Ken Ken can write the Ringo book, the All Star book. <laughs> I'd be happy to. How hard was it to get the stuff for McCartney? Well, as I said, I've been working for about fifteen years on the Lennonology project, and uh, I've done a number of. of related projects in in the meantime and have collected uh, this McCartney information and just stockpiled it away. Not Didn't have anything in, in mind for it. And then Ellen told me the, the project that he was working on that seemed like a natural fit. Mm-hmm. What, I, what I should have asked was, have you, in trying to develop, since you've had the project, have you run into roadblocks from McCartney? No, and I think this is kind of like the the Yoko project where, in regards to Leninology, where we did not contact her for assistance or permission um, just because we felt that the the constraints that she might put on the project might not allow us to tell it in as as a truthful light as as it deserved to be. And likewise with with McCartney, we don't know uh, what sort of information he might be able to provide that we don't already have and what mm-hmm. constraints he might throw on the, on the project. Mm-hmm. So it, okay. it's like the Leninology series is, is going to be a, a truthful reporting of, of what happened, and there's really nothing for him to be concerned about. It's, it's not going to be a, a kiss and tell at all. It's, it's going to be another reference book. Mm-hmm. Okay. Sounds right. good. And and what did you say is the projected date for the first volume? Hopefully, Alan. <laughs> I, I think we're looking at sometime in seventeen. Yeah, also sometime right. in two thousand seventeen. But I, I think after the next volume of Leninology comes out, yeah. that was the It'll idea, be. right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Both books will be before Lewison comes out with volume two of Tune In. That's the goal. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, we could we could uh, we could have both Leninology and McCartney Legacy come out at the same time and have a court battle, and one of us can hire Lee Eastman, and I mean yeah. uh, John Eastman, I suppose we can't really hire Lee at this point. Well, that's but, true. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't give Adrian any ideas. <laughs> but think of the publicity. <laughs> yeah. Really. Really. Anyway. Anyway. We should wrap Al up. Ended up suing himself. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, so thank you, Chip, and uh, it's it's been great having you back. And um, I think we uh, I, I think you've illuminated um, aspects of Imagine that that um, a lot of people didn't know much about. And uh, even though it's you know many people's favorite of his albums, certainly the most um, commercial of them, and. Uh, before we go, we should uh, see what Ken is up to uh, on your show and your website. Well, funny you should mention that, Alan. <laughs> since we since we brought up Mark Lewison, the uh, first volume of uh, the trilogy of his Beatles biography, uh, Tune In All These Years, just came out in paperback for the first time. And so on my website at KenMichaelsRadio.com, I have a special contest which starts this week where you can win it. I have three copies to give away. And also on my Beatles Trivia and Games page, I have a couple of very interesting things that you can win. The new Brian Wilson book, I Am Brian Wilson, A Memoir. 
the new Weakling CD uh, called Studio 2, signed by all four guys in the group. And since we've had Kiddo 2 on the show several times, and she's put out some really great books, one of which is a Beatle book called Songs We Were Singing, um, guided tours of the Beatles' lesser-known tracks, and recently a book on Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson FAQ. For one week only, you could possibly win both of them in one shot. So that's all on my website at KenMichaelsRadio.com. And that's it. You can also email me if you want at every little thing at att.net. Okay, Al, how do people get in touch with you? And do you have anything going on? Uh, on Facebook, um, uh, Al Sussman. On Twitter, at ASUSS49. Or through www.thebeetlefan.com. Uh, I'll call your attention again to the, uh, the brand new issue, which uh, just... Uh, uh, has been hitting uh, mailboxes uh, of a lot of the subscribers within the last uh, within the last week or so, which has uh, uh, a great leadoff uh, article on eight days a week and uh, and uh, everything else connected with it uh, by Alan, a piece by Jeff Slate, a piece by Larry Kane, uh, a couple of uh, a couple of fan pieces, including uh, kind of a perspective of mine uh etc etc it's a jam-packed issue and uh uh, again as i said a couple of weeks ago if you know if you've been kind of thinking about uh uh subscribing the beetle fan but uh you know haven't really gotten around to it this would be your a good first uh first issue for you so www.beetlefan.com and www.paradingpress.com for changing times, uh, 101 days to shape the generation. Okay, and Mr. Marinucci? I'm available on Facebook, on my own Facebook page, and there's a Beatles news group called Beatles News and Commentary that you can join, and we can talk about all sorts of Beatles things. Um, I will post links and talk about things and not talk politics, although after tomorrow, since this is the day before Election Day, um, there won't be much to talk about, but in any event... Um, well, well, who knows? Yeah, really. yeah, who knows? <laughs> who knows? But anyway, um, yeah, and and uh, I should uh, should have some stuff for Billboard pretty soon, and and uh, who knows? I may even do a story about this, this book uh, that we had just announced. <laughs> uh, so, um, but anyway, yeah, look for me on, on Facebook. My uh, email is beetlesexaminer at gmail.com. And I also have a YouTube channel that you're welcome to uh, subscribe to. And it does have uh, some of our uh, our shows on there. As a matter of fact, l- let me also mention that besides um, downloading on Podbean and iTunes, we have a YouTube channel with um, about half of the half of our shows. They're not all there, but about half the shows. And you can stream them without having to download them, or you can download them at Podbean and iTunes. So there you go. Okay, Chip, how do people get in touch with you? Uh, you can pretty much type one analogy into any browser, and I'll turn up somewhere on there, but... Uh, uh, www.leninology.com or you can reach me at chip at leninology.com Okay, great. Uh, you can write to the show um, and one or all of us may respond. Uh, send us ideas, send us complaints, send us praise, anything money, you like. Money, money, money. Money, yeah, right. Yeah, someone's going to send me $2 once, right? Um, anyway, our address is Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. And we have a Twitter feed, uh, which is the at sign Things We Said Fab. Um, Steve posts links to a lot of his uh, upcoming articles on the Twitter feed. Um, we also have a Facebook page, Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. That's Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. And you can reach me on Facebook at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And, uh, well, any, now you know what else I'm up to. And 
So thank you again, Chip, for coming, and thank you all for listening. So for Things We Said Today this week, this is Alan Cozen signing off for Ken Michaels, Al Sussman, and Steve Marinucci, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.